Volume One, Chapter Eight of Marius the Epicurean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Marius the Epicurean by Walter Pater, Chapter Eight, Animula Vagula. Animula, vagula, blandula, hospes comesque corporis, quae non cabibis in loca, palidula, rigida, nudula. The Emperor Hadrian to his soul. Flavian was no more. The little marble chest, with its dust and tears, lay cold among the faded flowers. For most people, the actual spectacle of death brings out into greater reality, at least for the imagination, whatever confidence they may entertain of the soul's survival in another life. To Marius, greatly agitated by that event, the earthly end of Flavian came like a final revelation of nothing less than the soul's extinction. Flavian had gone out as utterly as the fire among those still beloved ashes. Even that wistful suspense of judgment expressed by the dying Hadrian regarding further stages of being, still possible for the soul in some dim journey hence, seemed wholly untenable, and with it almost all that remained of the religion of his childhood. Future extinction seemed just then to be what the unforced witness of his own nature pointed to. On the other hand, there came a novel curiosity as to what the various schools of ancient philosophy had had to say concerning that strange, fluttering creature, and that curiosity impelled him to certain severe studies in which his earlier religious conscience seemed still to survive as a principle of hieratic scrupulousness or integrity of thought regarding this new service to intellectual light. At this time, by his poetic and inward temper, he might have fallen prey to the enervating mysticism then in wait for ardent souls in many a melodramatic revival of old religion or theosophy. From all this, fascinating as it might actually be to one side of his character, he was kept by a genuine virility there, effective in him, among other results, as a hatred of what was theatrical, and the instinctive recognition that in vigorous intelligence, after all, divinity was most likely to be found a resident. With this was connected the feeling, increasing with his advance to manhood, of a poetic beauty in mere clearness of thought, the actual aesthetic charm of a cold austerity of mind, as if the kinship of that to the clearness of physical light were something more than a figure of speech. Of all those various religious fantasies, as so many forms of enthusiasm, he could well appreciate the picturesque. That was made easy by his natural Epicureanism, already prompting him to conceive of himself as but the passive spectator of the world around him. But it was to severer reasoning of which such matters as Epicurean theory are born, that, in effect, he now betook himself. Instinctively suspicious of those mechanical arcana, those pretended secrets unveiled of the professional mystic, which really bring great and little souls to one level, for Marius the only possible dilemma lay between that old ancestral Roman religion, now become so incredible to him, and the honest action of his own untroubled, unassisted intelligence. Even the arcana celestia of Platonism, what the sons of Plato had had to say regarding the essential indifference of pure soul to its bodily house and merely occasional dwelling-place, seemed to him, while his heart was there in the urn with the material ashes of Flavian, or still lingering in memory over his last agony, wholly inhuman or morose as tending to alleviate his resentment at nature's wrong. It was to the sentiment of the body, and the affections it defined, the flesh, of whose force and colour that wandering platonic soul was but so frail a residue or abstract, he must cling. 
the various pathetic traits of the beloved, suffering, perished body of Flavian, so deeply pondered, had made him a materialist, but with something of the temper of a devotee. As a consequence, it might have seemed at first that his care for poetry had passed away, to be replaced by the literature of thought. His much-pondered manuscript verses were laid aside, and what happened now to one, who was certainly to be something of a poet from first to last, looked at the moment like a change from poetry to prose. He came of age about this time, his own master, though with a beardless face, and at eighteen, an age at which, then as now, many youths of capacity, who fancied themselves poets, secluded themselves from others, chiefly in affectation and vague dreaming. He secluded himself indeed from others, but in a severe intellectual meditation, that salt of poetry, without which all the more serious charm is lacking to the imaginative world. Still with something of the old religious earnestness of his childhood, he set himself, sich im Denken zu orientieren, to determine his bearings as by compass in the world of thought, to get that precise acquaintance with the creative intelligence itself, its structure and capacities, its relation to other parts of himself and to other things, without which, certainly, no poetry can be masterly. Like a young man rich in this world's goods coming of age, he must go into affairs and ascertain his outlook. There must be no disguises. An exact estimate of realities as towards himself he must have, a delicately measured gradation of certainty in things, from the distant haunted horizon of mere surmise or imagination, to the actual feeling of sorrow in his heart, as he reclined one morning, alone instead of in pleasant company, to ponder the hard sayings of an imperfect old Greek manuscript, unrolled beside him. His former gay companions, meeting him in the streets of the old Italian town, and noting the graver lines, coming into the face of the sombre but enthusiastic student of intellectual structure, who could hold his own so well in the society of accomplished older men, were half afraid of him, though proud to have him of their company. Why this reserve, they asked, concerning the orderly self-possessed youth, whose speech and carriage seemed so carefully measured, who was surely no poet like the rapt, dishevelled lupus. Was he secretly in love, perhaps, whose toga was so daintily folded, and who was always as fresh as the flowers he wore, or bent on his own line of ambition, or even on riches? Marius, meantime, was reading freely, in the early morning for the most part, those writers chiefly who had made it their business to know what might be thought concerning that strange enigmatic personal essence which had seemed to go out altogether along with the funeral fires. And the old Greek, who more than any other was now giving form to his thoughts, was a very hard master. From Epicurus, from the thunder and lightning of Lucretius, like thunder and lightning some distance off, one might recline to enjoy in a garden of roses. He had gone back to the writer who was, in a certain sense, the teacher of both, Heraclitus of Ionia. His difficult book, Concerning Nature, was even then rare, for people had long since satisfied themselves by the quotation of certain brilliant isolated oracles only, out of what was at best a taxing kind of law. But the difficulty of the early Greek prose did but spur the curiosity of Marius. The writer, the superior clearness of whose intellectual view had so sequestered him from other men, who had had so little joy of that superiority, being avowedly exacting as to the amount of devout attention he required from the student. The many, he said, always thus emphasising the difference between the many and the few, are, like people heavy with wine, led by children, knowing not whither they go, and yet much learning doth not make wise. And again, the ass, after all, would have his thistles rather than fine gold. 
Heraclitus, indeed, had not underrated the difficulty for the many of the paradox with which his doctrine begins, and the due reception of which must involve a denial of habitual impressions as the necessary first step in the way of truth. His philosophy had been developed in conscious outspoken opposition to the current mode of thought, as a matter requiring some exceptional loyalty to pure reason and its dry light. Men are subject to an illusion, he protests, regarding matters apparent to sense. What the uncorrected sense gives was a false impression of permanence or fixity in things, which have really changed their nature in the very moment in which we see and touch them. And the radical flaw in the current mode of thinking would lie herein, that, reflecting this false or uncorrected sensation, it attributes to the phenomena of experience a durability which does not really belong to them. Imaging forth from those fluid impressions a world of firmly outlined objects, it leads one to regard as a thing stark and dead what is in reality full of animation, of vigour, of the fire of life, that eternal process of nature of which at a later time Goethe spoke as the living garment, whereby God is seen of us ever in weaving at the loom of time. And the appeal which the old Greek thinker made was, in the first instance, from confused to unconfused sensation, with a sort of prophetic seriousness, a great claim and assumption such as we may understand, if we anticipate in this preliminary scepticism the ulterior scope of his speculation, according to which the universal movement of all natural things is but one particular stage or measure of that ceaseless activity wherein the divine reason consists. The one true being, that constant subject of all early thought, it was his merit to have conceived, not as a sterile and stagnant inaction, but as a perpetual energy from the restless stream of which, at certain points, some elements detach themselves and harden into non-entity and death corresponding as outward objects to man's inward condition of ignorance, that is, to the slowness of his faculties. It is with this paradox of a subtle perpetual change in all visible things that the high speculation of Heraclitus begins. Hence the scorn he expresses for anything like a careless, half-conscious, use and want reception of our experience which took so strong a hold on men's memories hence those many precepts towards a strenuous self-consciousness in all we think and do that loyalty to cool and candid reason which makes strict attentiveness of mind a kind of religious duty and service the negative doctrine then that the objects of our ordinary experience, fixed as they seem, are really in perpetual change, had been as originally conceived, but the preliminary step towards a large positive system of almost religious philosophy. Then as now, the illuminated philosophic mind might apprehend, in what seemed a mass of lifeless matter, the movement of that universal life in which things, and men's impressions of them, were ever coming to be, alternately consumed and renewed. That continual change, to be discovered by the attentive understanding, where common opinion found fixed objects, was but the indicator of a subtler but all-pervading motion, the sleepless, ever-sustained, inexhaustible energy of the divine reason itself, proceeding always by its own rhythmical logic, and lending to all mind and matter, in turn, what life they had. In this perpetual flux of things and of souls, there was, as Heraclitus conceived, a continuance, if not of their material or spiritual elements, yet of orderly, intelligible relationships, like the harmony of musical notes, wrought out in and through the series of their mutations, ordinances of the divine reason, maintained throughout the changes of the phenomenal world. And this harmony, in their mutation and opposition, was, after all, a principle of sanity, of reality there. 
but it happened that of all this the first merely sceptical or negative step, that easiest step on the threshold, had alone remained in general memory, and the doctrine of motion seemed to those who had felt its seduction to make all fixed knowledge impossible. The swift passage of things, the still swifter passage of those modes of our conscious being which seemed to reflect them, might indeed be the burning of the divine fire, but what was ascertained was that they did pass away like a devouring flame, or like the race of water in the mid-stream, too swiftly for any real knowledge of them to be attainable. Heraclitianism had grown to be almost identical with the famous doctrine of the sophist Protagoras, that the momentary sensible apprehension of the individual was the only standard of what is or is not, and each one the measure of all things to himself. The impressive name of Heraclitus had become but an authority for a philosophy of the despair of knowledge. And as it had been with his original followers in Greece, so it happened now with the later Roman disciple. He too paused at the apprehension of that constant motion of things, the drift of flowers, of little or great souls, of ambitious systems in the stream around him, the first source, the ultimate issue of which, in regions out of sight, must count with him as but a dim problem. The bold mental flight of the old Greek master, from the fleeting competing objects of experience to that one universal life, in which the whole sphere of physical change might be reckoned as but a single pulsation, remained by him as hypothesis only, the hypothesis he actually preferred, as in itself most credible, however scantily realisable even by the imagination yet still as but one unverified hypothesis, among many others, concerning the first principle of things. He might reserve it as a fine high visionary consideration, very remote upon the intellectual ladder, just at the point indeed where that ladder seemed to pass into the clouds, but for which there was certainly no time left just now, by his eager interest in the real object so close to him, on the lowlier earthy steps nearest the ground. And those childish days of reverie, when he played at priests, played in many another day-dream, working his way from the actual present, as far as he might, with a delightful sense of escape in replacing the outer world of other people, by an inward world, as himself really cared to have it, had made him a kind of idealist, he was become aware of the possibility of a large dissidence between an inward and somewhat exclusive world of vivid personal apprehension, and the unimproved, unheightened reality of the life of those about him. As a consequence, he was ready now to concede, somewhat more easily than others, the first point of his new lesson, that the individual is to himself the measure of all things and to rely on the exclusive certainty to himself of his own impressions. To move afterwards in that outer world of other people, as though taking it at their estimate, would be possible henceforth only as a kind of irony. And, as with the vicaire Savoyard, after reflecting on the variations of philosophy, the first fruit he drew from that reflection was the lesson of a limitation of his researches to what immediately interested him, to rest peacefully in a profound ignorance as to all beside, to disquiet himself only concerning those things which it was of import for him to know. At least he would entertain no theory of conduct which did not allow its due weight to this primary element of incertitude or negation in the conditions of man's life. Just here he joined company, retracing in his individual mental pilgrimage the historic order of human thought, with another wayfarer on the journey, another ancient Greek master, the founder of the Cyrenaic philosophy, whose weighty traditional utterances, for he had left no writing, served in turn to give effective outline to the contemplations of Marius. There was something in the doctrine itself, congruous with the place wherein it had its birth, 
and for a time Marius lived much, mentally, in the brilliant Greek colony, which had given a dubious name to the philosophy of pleasure. It hung, for his fancy, between the mountains and the sea, among richer than Italian gardens, on a certain breezy tableland projecting from the African coast, some hundreds of miles southward from Greece. There, in a delightful climate, with something of transalpine temperance amid its luxury, and withal in an inward atmosphere of temperance which did but further enhance the brilliancy of human life, the school of Cyrene had maintained itself as almost one with the family of its founder, certainly as nothing coarse or unclean, and under the influence of accomplished women. Aristippus of Cyrene, too, had left off in suspense of judgment as to what might really lie behind Flamantia Moinia Mundi, the flaming ramparts of the world. Those strange, bold, sceptical surmises, which had haunted the minds of the first Greek inquirers as merely abstract doubt, which had been present to the mind of Heraclitus as one element only in a system of abstract philosophy, became with Aristippus a very subtly practical worldly wisdom. The difference between him and those obscure earlier thinkers is almost like that between an ancient thinker generally and a modern man of the world. It was the difference between the mystic in his cell or the prophet in the desert, and the expert cosmopolitan administrator of his dark sayings, translating the abstract thoughts of the master into terms, first of all, of sentiment. It has been sometimes seen in the history of the human mind that when thus translated into terms of sentiment, of sentiment as lying already half-way towards practice, the abstract ideas of metaphysics for the first time reveal their true significance. The metaphysical principle in itself, as it were, without hands or feet, becomes impressive, fascinating, of effect, when translated into a precept as to how it were best to feel and act. In other words, under its sentimental or ethical equivalent. The leading idea of the great master of Cyrene, his theory that things are but shadows, and that we, even as they, never continue in one's day, might indeed have taken effect as a languid, enervating, consumptive nihilism, as a precept of renunciation, which would touch and handle and busy itself with nothing. But in the reception of metaphysical formulae, all depends, as regards their actual and ulterior result, on the pre-existent qualities of that soil of human nature into which they fall, the company they find already present there, on their admission into the house of thought, there being at least so much truth as this involves in the theological maxim, that the reception of this or that speculative conclusion is really a matter of will. The persuasion that all is vanity with this happily constituted Greek, who had been a genuine disciple of Socrates, and reflected, presumably, something of his blitheness in the face of the world, his happy way of taking all chances, generated neither frivolity nor sourness, but induced, rather, an impression, just serious enough, of the call upon men's attention of the crisis in which they find themselves. It became the stimulus towards every kind of activity, and prompted a perpetual, inextinguishable thirst after experience. With Marius, then, the influence of the philosopher of pleasure depended on this, that in him an abstract doctrine, originally somewhat acrid, had fallen upon a rich and genial nature, well fitted to transform it into a theory of practice, of considerable stimulative power towards a fair life. What Marius saw in him was the spectacle of one of the happiest temperaments, coming, so to speak, to an understanding with the most depressing of theories, accepting the results of a metaphysical system which seemed to concentrate into itself all the weakening trains of thought in earlier Greek speculation, and making the best of it, 
turning its hard bare truths with wonderful tact into precepts of grace and delicate wisdom and a delicate sense of honour given the hardest terms supposing our days are indeed but a shadow even so we may well adorn and beautify in scrupulous self-respect our souls and whatever our souls touch upon these wonderful bodies these material dwelling-places through which the shadows pass together for a while the very raiment we wear our very pastimes and the intercourse of society the most discerning judges saw in him something like the graceful humanities of the later roman and our modern culture as it is termed while horace recalled his sayings as expressing best his own consummate amenity in the reception of life in this way for marius under the guidance of that old master of decorous living those eternal doubts as to the criteria of truth reduced themselves to a scepticism almost dryly practical a scepticism which developed the opposition between things as they are and our impressions and thoughts concerning them the possibility if an outward world does really exist of some faultiness in our apprehension of it the doctrine in short of what is termed the subjectivity of knowledge that is a consideration indeed which lies as an element of weakness like some admitted fault or flaw at the very foundation of every philosophical account of the universe which confronts all philosophies at their starting but with which none have really dealt conclusively some perhaps not quite sincerely which those who are not philosophers dissipate by common but unphilosophical sense or by religious faith the peculiar strength of marius was to have apprehended this weakness on the threshold of human knowledge in the whole range of its consequences our knowledge is limited to what we feel he reflected we need no proof that we feel but can we be sure that things are at all like our feelings mere peculiarities in the instruments of our cognition like the little knots and waves on the surface of a mirror may distort the matter they seem but to represent of other people we cannot truly know even the feelings nor how far they would indicate the same modifications each one of a personality really unique in using the same terms as ourselves that common experience which is sometimes proposed as a satisfactory basis of certainty being after all only a fixity of language but our own impressions the light and heat of that blue veil over our heads the heavens spread out perhaps not like a curtain over anything how reassuring after so long a debate about the rival criteria of truth to fall back upon direct sensation to limit one's aspirations after knowledge to that in an age still materially so brilliant so expert in the artistic handling of material things with sensible capacities still in undiminished vigour with the whole world of classic art and poetry outspread before it and where there was more than eye or ear could well take in how natural the determination to rely exclusively upon the phenomena of the senses which certainly never deceive us about themselves about which alone we can never deceive ourselves and so the abstract apprehension that the little point of this present moment alone really is between a past which has just ceased to be and a future which may never come became practical with marius under the form of a resolve as far as possible to exclude regret and desire and yield himself to the improvement of the present with an absolutely disengaged mind america is here and now here or nowhere as Wilhelm Meister finds out one day, just not too late, after so long looking vaguely across the ocean for the opportunity of the development of his capacities. It was as if, recognising in perpetual motion the law of nature, Marius identified his own way of life cordially with it, throwing himself into the stream, so to speak. 
he too must maintain a harmony with that soul of motion in things by constantly renewed mobility of character omnis aristipum decuit color et status et reis thus horace had summed up that perfect manner in the reception of life attained by his old cyrenaic master and the first practical consequence of the metaphysic which lay behind that perfect manner had been a strict limitation almost the renunciation of metaphysical inquiry itself metaphysic that art as it has so often proved in the words of michelet de s'égarer avec méthode of bewildering oneself methodically one must spend little time upon that in the school of cyrene great as was its mental incisiveness logical and physical speculation theoretic interests generally had been valued only so far as they served to give a groundwork an intellectual justification to that exclusive concern with practical ethics which was a note of the cyrenaic philosophy how earnest and enthusiastic how true to itself under how many varieties of character had been the efforts of the greeks after theory theoria that vision of a wholly reasonable world which according to the greatest of them literally makes man like god how loyally they had still persisted in the quest after that in spite of how many disappointments in the gospel of st john perhaps some of them might have found the kind of vision they were seeking for but not in doubtful disputations concerning being and not being knowledge and appearance men's minds even young men's minds at that late day might well seem oppressed by the weariness of systems which had so far outrun positive knowledge and in the mind of marius as in that old school of cyrene this sense of ennui combined with appetites so youthfully vigorous brought about reaction a sort of suicide instances of the like have been seen since by which a great metaphysical acumen was devoted to the function of proving metaphysical speculation impossible or useless abstract theory was to be valued only just so far as it might serve to clear the tablet of the mind from suppositions no more than half realizable or wholly visionary leaving it in flawless evenness of surface to the impressions of an experience concrete and direct to be absolutely virgin towards such experience by ridding ourselves of such abstractions as are but the ghosts of bygone impressions to be rid of the notions we have made for ourselves and that so often only misrepresent the experience of which they profess to be the representation idola idols false appearances as bacon calls them later to neutralize the distorting influence of metaphysical system by an all-accomplished metaphysic skill it is this bold hard sober recognition under a very dry light of its own proper aim in union with a habit of feeling which on the practical side may perhaps open a wide doorway to human weakness that gives to the cyrenaic doctrine to reproductions of this doctrine in the time of marius or in our own their gravity and importance it was a school to which the young man might come eager for truth expecting much from philosophy in no ignoble curiosity aspiring after nothing less than an initiation he would be sent back sooner or later to experience to the world of concrete impressions to things as they may be seen heard felt by him but with a wonderful machinery of observation, and free from the tyranny of mere theories. So, in intervals of repose, after the agitation which followed the death of Flavian, the thoughts of Marius ran, while he felt himself as if returned to the fine, clear, peaceful light of that pleasant school of healthfully sensuous wisdom in the brilliant old Greek colony, on its fresh upland by the sea not pleasure but a general completeness of life was the practical ideal to which this anti-metaphysical metaphysic really pointed and towards such a full or complete life 
a life of various yet select sensation the most direct and effective auxiliary must be in a word insight liberty of soul freedom from all partial and misrepresentative doctrine which does but relieve one element in our experience at the cost of another freedom from all embarrassment alike of regret for the past and of calculation on the future this would be but preliminary to the real business of education insight insight through culture into all that the present moment holds in trust for us as we stand so briefly in its presence from that maxim of life as the end of life followed as a practical consequence the desirableness of refining all the instruments of inward and outward intuition of developing all their capacities of testing and exercising oneself in them till one's whole nature became one complex medium of reception towards the vision the beatific vision if we really cared to make it such of our actual experience in the world not the conveyance of an abstract body of truths or principles would be the aim of the right education of oneself or of another but the conveyance of an art an art in some degree peculiar to each individual character with the modifications that is due to its special constitution and the peculiar circumstances of its growth inasmuch as no one of us is like another all in all End of chapter 8